Well, for our next panel, we're going to take on which I believe is the most complex economic and fiscal challenge facing this country, which is how do we improve value in our health care system? Meaning, how do we lower costs while improving outcomes? And this is a very unique fiscal challenge because it doesn't just involve public policy, but involves the private sector and the overall entire delivery system. And in addition to that, we need to get right what this complex challenge is about, which includes issues like end of life, malpractice, obesity, the fee-for-service system. There's a multitude of challenges intertwined in a public and private sector issue. So t with us today to help sort this out and hopefully solve it in the next 35 minutes or so is Dr. Harvey Feinberg, President of the Institute of Medicine, Dr. Mar Mark McClellan, Director of the Brookings Institution and the former Administrator of CMS, Susan Denser, On-Air Health Policy Analyst for PBS NewsHour, and our moderator will be Ju Julie Rovner, Health Policy Correspondent for NPR. Please welcome them. Thank you. Thank you for coming back from lunch, which I appreciate. I will stop short of saying that uh, here as members of what I would call the healthcare community, the deficit problem is all our fault. But I will warn you that everyone here is looking to you guys to solve the problem, and we have less than 45 minutes to solve it. So I will jump right in. Uh, I'm going to start by taking up what I call the Bill Gates challenge, which is picking up on something he said this morning. I know that not all of you were here. Um, and that's how to make innovation in healthcare our friend rather than our enemy. Obviously, in technology and just about every other sector of the economy, innovation tends to make things less expensive. In healthcare, of course, it tends to be just the opposite. Is there any hope of turning that around? Clearly there is, and we're already seeing that. There's an enormous amount of disruptive innovation now going on in healthcare. As, for example, we bring to bear on healthcare new technologies that shift care out of institutions and into the home. Uh, we're seeing now remote monitoring come online, mobile applications and other things. And as we know, increasingly, we're able to import low-cost technologies that are used abroad, uh, like mobile apps to uh, provide care text for baby. Most people know about those kinds of applications. As we bring those back to the US, we can disrupt the current model, which is built heavily on institutional care, uh, basically uh, uh, visit by visit, in-person visits. As we move away from that, take up telemedicine and other technologies, it's clear we can disrupt the model and save at least some money in the process. And getting to that kind of disruption can be challenging in healthcare. This is not an industry and not part of our economy where we've typically paid more for better care at a lower cost, typically pay more for more stuff. And a lot of our regulatory frameworks, a lot of our other policies are designed around volume and intensity, not necessarily getting the best results for patients at the lowest cost. As Susan said, there are lots of examples of innovative, lower cost technologies coming in and changing the way that people are getting care and giving them more convenience and better results, fewer complications. But those are still kind of islands. They're not necessarily the, the, the fast and effective uh, path to, uh, to, to uh, effective innovation in healthcare. Uh, I do want to add, though, that there are going to be some more technologies coming along that are worth a lot, that are going to save lives that aren't being saved today because of cancers that are incurable or Alzheimer's disease and other conditions that are just worth spending a lot of money to try to address. But to make sure that we have room to afford those, we really need to, to step up our game on encouraging the cost-saving innovations as well. But a lot of the innovations, a lot of the innovations we keep hearing so much about in healthcare seem to be really expensive, things like personalized medicine, genomics, um, new biologic drugs. Um, aren't we looking at, at the cost of healthcare just going ever, ever higher? I think that we have a lot of drivers that increase costs, that is true. But the key around new technology that we want is what incentives do we put in place to induce the kind of technology that will not only improve the quality of care, but also save resources. And if we can do that, we'll get the technology that accomplishes both. It's very clear that this is going to be a challenge for us, though. We, uh, despite the promise of genomics and personalized medicine, there aren't a lot of these drugs on the market that yet that have proven to be very effective. Uh, and so we're hopeful that this will continue to be the case. But 
for a while we're going to have to ask, how much are we going to invest in these kinds of drugs that in many cases extend life just for a matter of months? Now maybe we'll get a break, more breakthroughs, but we will have a period of tension here where it really is a question of how much are we going to pay for how much increase in, in life. We know that rising health care costs are the driving factor in long-term debt projections. They also put pressure on families and on businesses that we've been hearing a lot about. What do you think is the single most important policy choice that Congress and the President could make to actually rein in health care spending? I'll start. Uh, let me, if, if, uh, just to expand the question a little bit, I want to talk about two, but they're both about paying for what we really want, better health at a lower cost. On the healthcare payment side for providers, as I mentioned a minute ago, many times we pay more for more intensity, more services, and that means that those American families are left with having to fend for themselves on coordinating care for, say, their mother, having to deal with costly complications that could have been prevented if uh, the, the best and latest evidence were really adopted, and not being able to take advantage of potentially cost-saving and quality-improving technologies like wireless monitoring, things that could be done from home. Many of those kinds of technologies are not paid for at all, are not paid for very well in our traditional provider payment systems. And as you heard, there are a lot of examples of providers working together, taking new steps in delivering care around the country now to try to change that. This is what they want to do to get better care for their patients, but very often they're swimming against the financial tide. They're, they're losing money uh, in, their, in their practices when they try to take these steps. So that needs to change. And I'd say the same thing needs to ch change on the consumer side as well. Well, many American consumers are in health plans where they get more financial support when the care they get costs more. They don't get much financial or other support for taking steps to use medications effectively, to stay healthy, to prevent complications in the first place. This is an area where many private employers have led the way on everything from wellness programs to value-based insurance designs to other steps to engage consumers in getting the best care for them. And if care is getting increasingly personalized and prevention-oriented, there's really no way to get to higher value unless we do a much better job of that. I would echo everything that Mark just said, but the other very important thing that the government can do is keep an eye on the health of the American public. We know that we have some of the poorest outcomes in health and health care of all the industrialized countries. We know that we lose twice as much time before, in terms of deaths before age 50 for both men and women, we lose twice the amount of life that the average of all the other industrialized countries does from all-cause mortality. We know that in 43% of U.S. counties, life expectancy for women is falling. Not, not rising anymore, just falling. Four years in life expectancy since 1990. And if you hold up a map of the United States, where is this happening? It's happening mostly in the red states or in the red parts of the blue states. Why is this happening? Obesity, chronic disease, prescription drug abuse, uh, many elements of health correlated with low education. And we know that if you are an adult with, a tw with less than a 12 years of education, your life expectancy today is what all Americans was 60 years ago, 60 years ago. So a federal government, in conjunction with state governments, has the capacity to put all of this on the table and ask why. What are the conditions that are predisposing so many Americans to poor health? And if we don't deal with that, in addition to what Mark and Harvey have already talked about with respect to health care, we're just going to have an even bigger problem 25 and 30 years down the road. Julie, I would just add that I think there's a, an immediate term, an intermediate term, and a longer term answer to your question. In the very, very near term, we need to focus on where the costs are very high, the high complexity patients, the very expensive hospitals, the settings and patients who can be cared for much more inexpensively with much higher quality. In the intermediate term, I think Mark's just right, it's the incentives. We need to adjust the incentives in the way doctors are reimbursed, the way hospitals get reimbursed, the way patients are faced with costs so that everyone is aware and mindful of choosing the best care at lower cost. And in the longer term, there will be no substitute for thinking of health solutions, which means the prevention of disease before it starts, enabling each of us to live longer, healthier lives without the need to take advantage of medical services in the long term 
that's our ticket to a trajectory of affordable health, not just care, but health. I want to turn just for a minute to a debate that's just sort of come up in the, in the health policy community over the last couple of weeks. It's become, I guess, an article of faith, if you will, in the, in the deficit debate that it's all about health care. As, as I mentioned at the top, it's all, it's all our fault, um, that, that health care is the single largest driver. And, and every, every single panel today has touched on health care to a lesser or greater degree. And yet there have been a number of papers over the past really couple of weeks that suggest we, we do know that over the past four years, health care spending has been rising at a much slower rate. Um, than it has in recent years. Um, everybody attributes that to some degree to the slowdown in the economy. The question now is how much of a degree that has been. There are now some economists suggesting that there are other things going on besides the recession and suggesting that perhaps there are, there are longer term things going on that perhaps we have maybe possibly bent the health care cost curve. Um, I'd like to know what each of you think about the possibility that that might be so. Well, I, I think there's clearly been uh, some contribution of higher cost sharing for consumers. We know, we know that if consumers have to pay more for health care, they demand less of it. And we've had a growth in cost sharing that's obviously contributed. The weak economy probably still has been the biggest factor. But in a way, who cares what happened over the last several years? What, happened, what matters is what's going to happen over the next five and 10 years. And are we going to seize the tools that Mark and Harvey have talked about to really cement this bending of the curve? That really is what's critical now. So are we making sure that we are appropriately asking people to bear a share of the cost? What are we going to do about supplemental Medicare coverage, for example, and first dollar coverage in Medicare, uh, which clearly fans a little bit more Medicare spending than we would like to see. Uh, what are we going to do in terms of creating new structures of the sort that will produce the high value care that Mark and others have described? That's really the argument we should be having, I think, even more so than looking back in the rear view mirror and trying to figure out what, what roads did we tra uh, transgress over the last few years. Let's talk about the future. Yeah, I, I, I uh, would say uh, as well that not surprisingly for something as complex as American health care, there's not just one obvious factor responsible for the overall trends we're seeing. Um, unquestionably, the economy and the slowdown, especially that, that uh, middle class workers are still feeling, uh, is having an impact. Uh, but uh, there are some signs that the way health care is being delivered is changing to focus more on those kinds of innovations that, uh, that we just described. Um, but uh, I, I I think what is the, the real reason for moving ahead uh, now or soon with considering some ideas for further reforms is that we just don't know. Um, things may slow down, uh, continue to slow down in terms of health care costs. I personally think that's unlikely looking ahead, hopefully with a much stronger economy and some of these really valuable new personalized med medicine innovations coming along. Uh, that means longer lives, better lives for people, but it also probably means more health care spending, and that's all the more reason to think about uh, effective reforms now. Most importantly, though, for the reason for reform is that the way medical care is being delivered or should be delivered is changing. It's getting more personalized. It's including a wider range of technologies like the ones that we've been talking about here that just don't fit well into our current health care policies. They just don't fit well into Medicare's fee-for-service benefits or Medicare's uh, Medigap and, and other benefit designs. And if, if now is the main time to change that, not because not mainly because it's going to save money in the long term, because this is the way to get Americans better health. You know, Julie, we at the Institute of Medicine, we did a study about the current array of costs and benefits in health care, estimated that today $750 billion per year does not contribute to better health, even though it's expended in the name of health. And when you have that size of a target of opportunity, to reduce costs while enhancing the quality of care and improving outcomes, that's where we should be focusing. We don't have to wait even to know whether the growth is going to be a little slower or a little faster. We've got a tremendous opportunity right where we are now to change the way we organize, pay for, and deliver care so that we can achieve better outcomes and at lower cost. That's, I think, where our focus should be. 
I think it's we we saw a little bit earlier with the, the political panel, if you will. Conservatives and liberals seem to agree that healthcare cost containment is an important objective, something we all want to get to, but they obviously disagree on how to achieve it. Progressives obviously put more weight on government action through payment policies, regulation. Conservatives have more confidence in the market and budget constraints. Is there ever going to be a way that these different approaches can be bridged to achieve this common objective? Well, there are lots of things I think that both sides buy into. Let's take, for example, shared decision making. When you put in front of people the evidence about what a particular medical procedure will or will not achieve, and to pick up on Harvey's point, Institute of Medicine has said that about 50% of the care that we provide in this country has no direct evidence that it works, right? Half. So let's take the evidence that does exist, put it in front of people, walk them carefully through the choices that face them, whether it's on back surgery or knee replacement surgery or what have you, uh, show them the results, and empower them to make enlightened decisions with the aid of their medical providers. All of the experiments that have been done testing shared decision making show that nine times out of 10, people will elect less uh, more conservative, less risky approaches than their physicians might recommend, and they tend to pass up a lot of the very costly care, especially surgery. Now, that's a win-win for everybody. If patients are better informed, get what they want, uh, feel more enlightened, and get support from physicians who are really helping them to get the, pre the preferred care that they need. So I think we have to look across these kinds of uh, areas where there really could be bridging uh, decisions and support made and maximize the efforts that we're going to make in those arenas. Julie, last week our group at Brookings issued a report that included a, a wide range of both political and, and healthcare experts, including people like um, Tom Daschle and Peter Orzag, Mike Levitt, um, Glenn Hubbard, as well as a range of, of healthcare economic and policy experts who have advised both parties. And this was a report that was about how to get to, what could we all agree on in the end? In fact, the way Mike Levitt phrased it when we first started meeting uh, quietly uh, last year was that, well, you know, let's say we're at that point when for whatever reason, financial concerns, sequestration uh, impact, or just uh, American public being fed up with the gaps in the quality of care that they're facing, for whatever reason, uh, the parties are willing to come together. Is there enough substance there that they could, could really agree on? Um, this framework and several others that have been released recently give me a, a a lot of hope but that there is. Uh, they all have in common, and uh, ours, uh, I think, highlights this, uh, moving away from fee-for-service, not through uh, uh, just a, a haphazard uh, uh, type of response or hoping that if Medicare keeps squeezing down the payments on everybody long enough, they'll get, uh, tired, of, they'll, they'll get tired of providing care that way, but a, a proactive approach to supporting the kinds of improvements in care delivery, the kinds of improvements in decision-making for patients by moving Medicare to a Medicare comprehensive care framework that focuses on paying more for better care at a lower cost, and that also gives seniors the option of choosing in a uh, reinvigorated and more competitive level playing field Medicare Advantage program with, with private plans available. And we have kind of parallel reform proposals for Medicaid, for supporting innovations in private health insurance, uh, all that would add up to over $300 billion in savings over 10 years, even more, but we wanted to reinvest some of that in helping providers and Medicare beneficiaries make this transition and getting to a growth rate of all of our entitlement programs that's right in line with GDP. Now, this is not the same thing as members of Congress uh, in on the Hill actually agreeing to it, but there is a foundation there that I think is, is new and is going to continue to strengthen as a basis for effective health care reform in the months and years ahead, hopefully sooner rather than later. I just, I remember a lot of similar kinds of studies before we did the Affordable Care Act where everybody seemed to agree that this was the kind of policy that made sense and then things kind of splintered. But well, we, it's, it's, we always, it. <laughs> it's, all, it's always going to be hard. I mean, in yeah. addition to the common areas of agreement that Mark cited among these various studies, including the bipartisan Bipartisan Policy Center report and so on, there's a lot of convergence now around finally doing something about the tax, I shouldn't say finally because we did the Cadillac tax, but taking the next step on the tax exclusion for health insurance. The tax expenditure for health insurance, uh, employer-provided insurance is, as we know, worth about $200 billion. 
almost all of the reports recommend some further steps to cap that exclusion. Uh, and we could take the savings and use, put them toward the deficit, or might, we might be able to take the savings and use them for other purposes. But I think it's another one that people have been talking about for 25 years. Maybe we'll have to talk about it a few more years, years. but if tax reform, as we heard earlier today, really is in the uh, wings, I think that there is finally a, a consensus across the parties that limiting the tax exclusion would be an important step. Julie, you know, I've been in Washington now for just over a decade, and I've been told that in Washington, a pessimist is a well-informed optimist. <laughs> Nevertheless, I can't help but be encouraged and optimistic based on two things. First, the level of agreement that we're seeing in a number of different efforts to bring the parties together, or at least individuals of goodwill representing a whole spectrum of background in political sense and having a lot of convergence around the, the logical next things to do. And secondly, I believe that the American people demand, as well as deserve, a set of reforms that will make sense. Uh, in Washington, it's very hard to talk about end of life. The American people want to talk about end of life. I believe that most of us, when we've lived through it with a parent or a loved one, experienced in our families, uh, we know that we could do better uh, often than we actually experience. And if we just give people more of an opportunity to express what they want and assure that the system listens to what they want, uh, we can do better to take care of people and save a lot of money. I would be remiss if we didn't talk at least a little bit about the Affordable Care Act. So um, I, I would love to know what each of you think about the, the impact that uh, the law either is having. Of course, if you listen to the administration, it is already having an impact on health care spending. But the, the impact that you think that either is having or might have in the future on, uh, on long-term health care spending. Well, we don't know. Uh, I think that we do believe that a lot of the, uh, the seeds have been sown now for the kinds of delivery system reforms that we've been talking about. Uh, whether it's accountable care organizations, whether it's bundled payment and Medicare, whether it's uh, new ways of delivering care for the very costly dual eligible population, uh, all of those experiments are, are positive. Not all of them will work, let's face it, and not all of them will pay off, but some of them probably will. They, we just now have to take things to the next level. And if you look at what is at the basis of, uh, of the Engelberg Center report or the Bipartisan Policy Center report, that's what it is. It's let's take this movement now, not to pay for volume, but pay for value, and kick it up multiple notches. Let's uh, do even more to organize care and take out the unnecessary care and get rid of the the handoffs that uh, result in people going back into the hospital. I mean, we know what is driving things like avoidable Medicare readmissions. It's people not understanding their medications and going home and taking double the dose instead of half the dose. All of those things that are features of a completely fragmented healthcare system that many of the elements of the Affordable Care Act now are designed to attack. We just have to take those much, much farther, and not just in the public sector, in the private sector as well. And so to the degree that more and more things are happening that really stretch across both private payers and public payers, where they're doing things together and driving the system in different ways with the same set of incentives, that's what we need to do more of. If we do all of that, I think most of us believe that we will have a lower rate of spending growth in the future than we have had in the past, and we'll have a more sustainable system. That's a, a lot of ifs, and I think <laughs> right now it's sort of way too soon to care, uh, to, to, not to care, to uh, way, too, way too soon to tell. We definitely uh, care oh, about the, uh, the impact of the Affordable Care Act. Um, I think the, the short-term impact probably is going to be increases in costs that come along with coverage expansions, and the big question is, how much are these coverage and expansions really going to contribute to changes in the way that, that care is delivered, changes in the way that people take steps to stay healthy and, and uh, use medical treatments effectively. There are a lot of ideas out there on, on both sides of the aisle that giving people competitive choices of health plans with much better information and um, much better attention to preventing adverse selection problems and the like 
is the path to, to getting to lower health care costs and better health, more secure coverage for Americans in the long term. And our problems with the gaps in employer coverage and the problems with the individual markets are not going away. But I think we got a uh, got quite an implementation process ahead of us. It's not going to be over in a few months. Uh, it's not clear that there's going to be any new legislation in this area given the, the different views of the parties in the short term. But I think this is going to be at least a several year process with uh, hopefully some opportunities opportunities for taking stock, course corrections, and improvements along the way. The only point I would add, Julie, is that by providing coverage now to the vast majority, still not everyone, but to the vast majority of people in the United States, the Affordable Care Act has allowed the conversation to move now in a more focused way on these questions of value and affordability. So it was a very important step in order to get us to the point where we can have this focused attention on what do we need to do to reform health care and the way health care is delivered in order to afford it, in order to enable it not to be the deal breaker on the long-term debt of our country. So that is itself a great achievement. Mark, you were involved in the rollout of the, the Medicare Part D program, which I think was the last time the, the government tried something this major. Um, uh, it, it, can you contrast sort of how, how, that, how you prepared for that with what the government is doing now? Do you think they're doing, uh, uh, first of all, have they asked you for advice? <laughs> yes, we, we, we have uh, been talking. A lot of the same people who I worked with closely at CMS and HHS are the same staff that are involved in figuring out how to make the IT systems work, working with states on uh, uh, Medicaid-related interactions. You know, we had dual eligible beneficiaries to deal with, to deal with there, and also the the IT systems, the web systems, the the, the uh, consumer support numbers. So. A lot of those issues are the same. This is an order of magnitude more complicated and challenging. Uh, on the other hand, there's not, um, say, this, say this the right way, um, we had a real urgency problem in that, say, 7 million beneficiaries who had been previously getting drug coverage on Medicaid and had a lot of very serious health problems had to cut, switch coverage in all in the same day, January 1st, 2006, and have that coverage with as few disruptions as possible. That was a huge lift and there were a lot, uh, a lot of bumps in making that happen. Even if, uh, uh, even if you think you've done all the prep work and all the data systems talk to each other and so forth, there are problems with the right data doesn't flow, people aren't quite ready, there's a lot of confusion, uh, and that's going to be an issue here as well, but I think it's going to be spread out over a longer period. Uh, we did start early. We had um, uh, a, a lot of work around the country uh, with the bus tour starting in January the year before to build a foundation as I think uh, um, Secretary Sebelius is now saying, to reach people where they live and work and play and pray. Um, we did have some uh, collaborations with states that I think are more complicated now. We didn't have to rely on any federal fallbacks. We had uh, just one uh, uh, Medicare program setting up exchanges in each part of the country, and I think that's going to make this a, a, a longer-term proposition and one where, uh, hopefully, as I said before, there will be some more opportunities for course corrections and, and getting over some of the inevitable bumps. I, I spent a lot of time with Mark on the bus uh, back right. in 2005 mm -hmm. going around the Rode country. Around and my this, memory yeah. of that period, Mark, I'd be interested to get your perspective, was that almost everything that everybody predicted would happen when Part D was implemented didn't happen. And the things that did happen, nobody predicted. And one of the things that didn't happen, uh, or I should say was the reverse of what people predicted, people said N nobody, no. Part D plans will come in and take on this business because, of course, it would be suicide to insure elderly people buying drugs. And, of course, we had the opposite problem, right. multiple multiples plans, 50-plus in some states. Uh, so, and the other thing that didn't happen was that the cost did not go through the roof yes. because we, the, the whole movement toward coverage produced hastened the movement to generic drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was something that nobody anticipated would happen to the degree that it has, and it has held down the cost of that program. So I just put that out there by way of saying, we should wait a few years before we decide what we think the effect of the Affordable Care Act is going to be, because there will be things in this that surprise us. We're, we're running a little bit out of time. I want to talk a little bit about Medicaid. Um, Medicaid, obviously, as you know, is about to undergo a very large expansion. 
Does it make sense, obviously we have 50 different Medicaid systems, or should maybe the federal government play a larger role in Medicaid um, and reduce the financial burdens on states and make the program more uniform uh, across the, the 50 different programs that we have now? Well, the Medicaid programs we have now it is 50 different programs in 50 different states, and some of that variation is good. States have different health systems, different health issues, different priorities, and this is, was designed as a federal state partnership for a reason. Uh, however, there's no question that the Medicaid statute and, and the way the program's operating is built on, uh, at best, a, a shaky and outdated infrastructure. The benefits on the books for Medicaid were created in 1965. They're all, again, about fee-for-service medicine, about getting care in institutions if you're, if you're elderly and, and uh, have uh, uh, impairments, not, not about care at home. Uh, they are nothing in there about care coordination. In fact, the federal state split of some of the benefits get in the way of all of that. As a result, states have had to spend a lot of effort, and the federal government too, coming up with these one-off waiver approaches to try to help Medicaid move in the direction of more up-to-date benefits, better uh, quality care, and keeping costs under control, and it's really hard uh, as a, as a one-off set of exercises. We know enough now about ways in which innovative Medicaid programs can work that it's time to shift the focus and get to uh, a more systematic infrastructure that is focused on the same thing we've just been talking about here today as a recurrent theme, better care at a lower cost. In our Bending the Curve report that I mentioned earlier, uh, Republican and Democratic members of our group all supported a move to away from the waiver program to a more standard approach to Medicaid where states would get um, more support for taking steps to improve quality and lower costs, using innovative approaches to care, an infrastructure at the federal government level that is much more systematic in supporting that and monitoring for the kinds of quality problems that I know many people are worried about uh, with real Medicaid reforms, uh, and also that gives states more savings when they take steps to improve quality and lower costs at the same time. One challenge with the, the matching way that Medicaid works now, and especially with the new expansions where 100% of the match is paid by the federal government, is that states are the ones that have to take the steps to redesign this program, to make, the, uh, make it work with managed care plans, with accountable care organizations, with other innovative approaches, and they get very little of the savings from those steps. Our reform would change that so that uh, when they take steps to improve quality and lower costs, there would be a systematic way of getting them more predictable financial support, and also there would be a much more systematic infrastructure for identifying what's working and helping states move in this direction. Medicaid's outdated, the benefit uh, design, the statute's outdated, it's time to update it. We do have to remember that about uh, a third of the Medicaid beneficiaries who are the elderly and disabled are responsible for about two-thirds of the cost of the Medicaid program. So that gets us back to the issue that we haven't talked about yet, which is long-term services and supports, long-term care. Now we know we threw out the Community Living Assistance Services and Supports Act that was part of the Affordable Care Act. We repealed that in December. That doesn't mean we repealed the problem of how America's families are going to afford and sustain the amount of care that's going to have to be provided to their elderly and disabled loved ones going forward. We still have to figure out, since the, in this particular instance, it does not appear that the private long-term care insurance market is robust enough to deal with this problem, and in fact, it looks like it's disintegrating. So we still have that problem out there, and how we address that in our current fiscal situation, I don't think anybody knows at this point, but it, it remains on the table as undone work uh, that we're going to have to continue to focus on, notwithstanding the positive results that Mark mentioned as we move care out of institutions and into homes and communities. Who's going to care for these people? What is the level of training uh, that we're going to require of tomorrow's home care workers? All of those things remain on the table for us to deal with. With 78 million baby boomers. Right. I would just say that uh, the most important aspect of what I think both uh, Mark and Susan are talking about to me is the capacity to have a patient-centered approach to deal with the real needs of what patients experience. And the patients that are uh, poor, uh, in difficult socioeconomic circumstances, in communities with lack of supports, uh, often with multiple chronic diseases, 
these are the patients that really do need uh, the kind of flexibility that the proposals uh, would allow so that you can really put together the family of services that they require in home, uh, in chronic care, as well as when they need it, acute care, that really meets their needs. And uh, any movement in uh, Medicaid toward that goal, I think, is a positive move. Not that the Affordable Care Act needed any more controversy, but uh, last week, uh, the results of a, of a uh, sort of exceptional randomized controlled trial on Medicaid came out. New England Journal of Medicine um, looked at, uh, at 20,000 people in Oregon, 10,000 of whom got Medicaid and 10,000 of whom didn't. And uh, the results of the first part of the study had been sort of uniformly positive. And the results of this now second arm of the study found that, yes, Medicaid did help people significantly with financial expenses um, and getting care and actually with depression, but that it did not actually improve their health status. And now uh, there seems to be a, a lot of people saying, well, if it doesn't improve their health, then maybe we should rethink the idea of expanding Medicaid as part of the Affordable Care Act, and I'm wondering where you all come down on, the, on that question. Well, first of all, just to go back to the point about health, we know that the health care you receive is at best 10 to 20 percent of the determination of your overall health status. So it's not going to be a surprise that you take people who haven't had access to care who are in the Medicaid population and are, by virtue of that are lower income and probably less educated as well. The fact that you don't transform their health status in a couple of years of Medicaid coverage, is that is not a surprise. I think what we need to do is, first of all, let these experiments go a little bit longer, first of all, to see what happens. Improve the quality of care because these folks were getting care in our current healthcare delivery system. There's no guarantee that it is the optimum that, that we've all been describing that we need to shoot for. Uh, but even if we do that, we still have these major health challenges for Americans that we've got to grapple with. And to pretend that we're going to deal, really, really move the needle on the health status of individuals just by giving them access to care, even the level of care that we're providing now, I think is foolish. Yeah, just the focus on expanding coverage is, is clearly not enough. Um, it, it, it is true that there were some financial benefits for these individuals, um, but there still were there before and after, after were a lot of big gaps in quality of care, big gaps in opportunity to prevent costly chronic diseases and their complications. And I think there's one bottom line lesson that's that you, know, you can't just keep with the traditional kind of healthcare coverage that we've had in the past. Oregon, uh, incidentally, is, is not doing it. They've since implemented a fundamental reform in the way that they're structuring their Medicaid benefits uh, to implement what they're calling uh, community care organizations, which are much more community-based approaches that are intended to get exactly the kinds of issues that Harvey was bringing up. It turns out for many of these patients, some of the obstacles to care are not things like, um, uh, not simply things like getting access to, say, asthma medications, but risk factors in the home from uh, old, uh, dirty carpets and, and things like that and it turns out that with a more person focused approach it is cheaper to prevent the health care problems and get, to get to better outcomes but you can't do that in traditional Medicaid and I think this is sort of an exclamation point uh, that we need to move forward now uh, with uh, support for reforming the way that care is delivered to focus on people and what they really need and not just health insurance benefits that pay more for uh, for more medical services. The only point I would add uh, from my vantage point is that I know we can do better both in, in reaching people with the services that they actually need by delivering the right mix and in the right place and in the right way. Lots of evidence about that. The key is that we do that at the same time that we are saving a lot of resources that are currently being expended in ways that do not benefit patients. If we can bring that together, we can improve health and we can help to solve the long-term debt of the United States. Well, we're just about out of time, but I know the, the biggest issue that I, I come upon is that people really don't understand health care. And I think right now they, they, they conflate saving money in health care with not getting enough. Is there, is there one thing that you can tell people that, that how you can, that controlling health care costs does not necessarily mean lessening the quality of health care? 
I think you have to show them. And uh, I think there are a lot of good, innovative reforms around the country that are being led by physicians, healthcare providers, people that, that uh, uh, Americans trust, uh, not necessarily that uh, insurance companies and the government aren't at the top of the, the trust list, but a lot of these reforms in care are being led by health professionals working with, working with patients. And I think that's the, the best way to do this, is to show people that uh, you can get better care and save money at the same time. That's what uh, Bill Gates uh, emphasized this morning. And just to pick up on that point, uh, a number of the medical specialty groups have uh, joined in on something called the Choosing Wisely campaign, where they have identified, in some instances, 5, 10, 15 things that they do as specialists that they know they should not do and that patients should not ask for. And as more and more of those efforts come forward and people identify, look, we know we are doing things that are not necessary, costly, and in some instances, harmful for patients. Uh, that itself, I think, can help people understand that not all care that is provided is good and not all care that is provided is of benefit to them. And we've got to start, if we're, if we're going to have room in our economy to spend the kinds of money that we all want to spend on drugs to alleviate all suffering from Alzheimer's or other things, we've got to take out of the system the care that is not worth paying for and not worth having and can be dangerous. And if the doctors are saying it themselves, uh, then I think we ought to pay attention. The great compact to me, Julie, is when every citizen, every patient knows that what they need, they will have available to them when they need it. And at the same time, have the confidence and the opportunity to share in the decision making so that they only get what they really need and want and do not find themselves or members of their family in a situation where they're getting services that will not contribute to their health. Well, thank you. I think so that's where we'll have to leave it for now, but I'm sure the debate will continue. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.